Okay, hey guys, welcome to Trainer's Corner, and we are fi we finally made it with Sarah uh, after some technical troubles at Trumplow page. Mm, so this time we are here, and hopefully you you're going to hear as well and see as well, uh, because today we want to talk about motivating operation, right, Sarah? That's right. Hmm, wonderful. It's I think it's a very important topic because. In general, when people think about motivation, they think in terms of labels mm -hmm. rather than something tangible, something that we can measure. Right. Well, the, the biggest thing that I'm doing now is thinking always in terms of contingencies. Mm. And so I'm just thinking always in terms of what's the, the, the package the whole mm. package all the time. And the MO is part of that. The motivating operations are definitely a piece of that whole. And I think of each piece like puzzle pieces that fit together. Mm -hmm. So we have our, we have our antecedents. Those are the immediate things, right? That, let, let's just keep it simple, like just a training context. So the trainer's standing there with the food and you're saying your cues. Yep. So the immediate things. And then we have the behaviors the dogs are doing, the dog is doing, and then we have those consequences. And the consequences are being signaled by the A, by the antecedents. So the A's tell the learner, these consequences are available. Mm -hmm. That's what the A does, right? Can we give a specific example so people maybe can... Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, like I said, a very, I'm trying to keep it really simple. So you're in a training setting, you're you release the dog from station. They come to front position and they look at you. They can smell the food. They, they have a learning history. They know exactly what that picture means. Mm -hmm. And the animal is going to offer you something. So yeah. my dogs tend to offer me base position, which is standing there and looking at me. Mm -hmm. So when they offer me that, it tells me that those A's, those antecedents are signaling a reinforcer that they care about. That matters to them yeah. right so that otherwise they would just go sniff or look out the window or chase a squirrel they, they, yeah they would do something else because uh but because another you know another antecedent would take over but in that context they go oh they read the picture and they go the, these antecedents are important to me because they are signaling this opportunity i want the things that are going to come as the consequence Okay. So, so that would be the ABC. The A is me standing there with food. The B is the behavior of standing in front position and offering eye contact. Mm -hmm. And then the C would be either, let's say the C is I give them a cue to do another reinforcing behavior. Like we start working on sit or down. Mm -hmm. or, okay. Right. So now we have a nice little, so that's like a little capsule. The okay. ABC right there. Do you see? So I think of those as, so the, so the contingency means they are all three pieces are contingent on one another, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? The A doesn't mean anything without the C. Yeah. Right. And if the A and the C are weak, the B is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. True. Right. Absolutely. And if the B doesn't happen, the C doesn't happen. Yeah. So yeah. do you see how that, that's why contingency means all of those pieces have to happen in order for it all to make sense. Yes. And if, but sometimes we have the situation, we have the contingency and mm -hmm. it doesn't work as it should. Exactly. Uh huh. And that's when you might start thinking about motivating operations. Mm, okay. Because the motivating operations the way I've been thinking about them, it's sort of like the backpack. It's a backpack of influences mm -hmm. that your dog is bringing to the party. They're bringing this backpack with them mm -hmm. from, uh, and in that backpack could be all sorts of things. It could be fatigue. Mm -hmm. It could be satiation level. Yeah. Like, are they really, really hungry or not? Mm -hmm. uh, it could be they just had a big scare outside. There was a really loud noise. Mm -hmm. And they, so when they come into that ABC, that ABC capsule, they're bringing this little backpack mm -hmm. of more distant antecedent, more, more distant influencers. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So that's going to affect what, what that C, how relevant and strong that C is to them. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about this is it changes. It can change moment to moment. So an example is I just posted for my students. I took a video of me working with my dog, Tucker. Mm -hmm. The goal behavior for the session was that when I say trade and hold up food, he looks at the food and eats the food. Mm -hmm. This is a really important cue for him because this is how I get toys. I can pick up a toy safely because so it, the, so the goal behavior was I say trade, I hold up my hand. He mm -hmm. looks at my hand. I feed him. I can pick up the toy. So at the beginning of the session, he was very, the, the, the motivating operations for food contingency were very high. So every time I said trade, he had low latency. He was like, boom, look at my hand for the food. Boom, okay. really, really focused. So when I started my session, I would say the motivating operations were making the food contingency very strong. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But then I got, then I got out. A he agrees. Ball. He agrees. And then I got out a tennis ball. Okay. So first so, there was no toys. I mean, no toys. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. No toys. And then I got up, but then I wanted to show my students, okay, this is how you condition your trade cue. And then I, I, he needed a toy for me to do the trades with. So I got him a tennis ball. Okay. <laughs> so in the, in the beginning of the session, he would take the tennis ball and, 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 and he would chew it and I'd throw it a little bit, but he was still able to immediately respond to my trade cue. Mm -hmm. So, and what that looks like is I'd say trade and he'd spit the tennis ball out and immediately focus mm -hmm. on the food. So that told me in the first one or two minutes of my session, the food contingency was still strong. Okay, so the value of food, the value of food in this contingency was strong. It was high. It was right. something that reinforced the behavior effectively. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we could talk about the word value. I'm not sure about that word value, but what I could measure was that I had very low latency yeah. in response to the A of trade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I have that low latency, that boom, boom, you know that the contingency is strong because that A is really relevant. It's yeah. strong. So here's what happened though. Then I started throwing the ball, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of repetitive, uh, fetching. Yeah. And after just about three minutes of that, mm -hmm. when I went to do a trade, I no longer had a, a response to my trade cue. He just stared at the ball. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and what I do with Tucker, I say, fine, you don't, you don't want my trade. I don't, I don't nag. I say yeah. that's information. So I picked up the ball. I kept throwing it. Mm -hmm. Now, Motivating operations can go two ways. On the one hand, if sometimes if you satiate, you say, okay, I'm going to throw the ball a lot. And the more you chase it, you're going to get tired or you're going to feel satisfied or, you know, you, you make up a lot of things that you think the animal is feeling. And then you're going to want to trade because the more you play, you're going to feel satisfied. Mm -hmm. And that would be a called, if that worked, that would be called an abolishing operation, right? Uh, I for would, the toy. For the toy. Mm -hmm. But that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. The more I played with him, the, the less responsive he was to the food. In fact, I got to a point where I could just put all the chicken on the floor. And nothing. And, and he, just stared at the, he just stared at the ball. He said, no, I just want you to throw the ball. And so the, the motivating operations, whatever was in that backpack, shifted. And it was shifted dependent on the actual activity that he was doing, the, the, the repetitive game. In the beginning of the session, he could have the tennis ball and trade just and fine. Trade. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so, so then I finally said, well, okay, my rule is I don't ever pick up toys and put them away. If he does not accept a trade, he keeps the toys. That's, how, that's the rule. Mm -hmm. But I had to stop throwing the ball. So I give him a cue, all done. Okay. I let him keep the ball. So all done means we are not playing together anymore. I'm not yeah. involved anymore. Uh -huh. It means I. It means he can keep the ball, but I'm, yeah. I'm not going to play with it anymore. But it. after an all done, I have to change the antecedents, or he will bark. Yeah, so, obviously. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I walk away, mm -hmm. and I start puttering around. I mean, it's not like a timeout or anything. I just no, no. all done. Yeah, I'm go. done. 
Yeah, and he can keep so, the ball. So he still has access to a reinforcer. So you're not yeah. taking access to reinforcer, nope. which means it's not a timeout. To, yeah. Nope. Yeah. Right. But he, he it did stop the fetching. You know, he if I had stood there, he mm -hmm. probably would have been stuck in that, you know, fetch the ball, fetch the ball. Yeah. 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 So I walk away, I putter, I put the toys away, I might turn the camera off. Mm -hmm. Not very long, three minutes later, I come back to him and I say, How do you feel about my trade now? Mm -hmm. And I ask him, I go, trade? And immediately he looks at the chicken, takes the mm -hmm. chicken, I can pick up yep. the ball. Mm -hmm. So there was this shift in motivating operations mm -hmm. several different times in that one session. But if you look at the immediate antecedents, right, me with, with me and the ball, yeah. that stayed the same. Yeah. But the, the contingencies shifted three or four times in, in a, you know, in a 10 minute session. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this just brought up so many questions and it was so interesting to me because I realized this is so fluid. This is happening all the time. Um, that's why like mm -hmm. you're in a training session. Let's say this always has baffled me, right? Mm -hmm. Your dog is meeting criteria. Your mm -hmm. dog gives you the perfect response four times in a row. Yeah. And, you're, and your timing is right. You click it correctly that you know that the dog is understanding the criteria and then on the fifth one it all goes and you're like but you but you understand this like <laughs> you know, what happened you know what why did, why did i get variability uh, now when know? it was all perfect and right. what we do very often in this particular moment is we try again because i know i know, I know. It's, it's the worst <laughs> and if you try again the chances are it's going to get worse right so and this is this because there is this common common advice that you may hear very often in training. It's like you should end on a good note. And so what people do is actually they try again, try again, and they go into prompting even though they were not prompting in those correct, perfect repetitions. They go to some pressure. They go to physical corrections even though they don't use them. Because they just want to see the behavior because this isn't reinforcing for us. Right. So, and this is actually going into, and, and the behavior is going to deteriorate and deteriorate. You're not going to get what you got previously because something has changed. And, exactly. exactly. And, and you, ha yeah. you haven't changed the A, you haven't changed mm -hmm. the C, nothing has changed, but something changed because fatigue. that's why fatigue Maybe. might be, fatigue is a big one. Yeah, it's a very, a very common one, I would say. It's uh -huh. like I could see, like with position changes, for example, in Gapjo, he's perfect in his position changes. I mean, when uh, there are times where he can do them absolutely perfectly to the criteria. I, so, and then if I'm going to overdo them, he will just, you'll see that he may not be able to keep his front stable, that like there is going to be a little weight shift. And then this is information for me that this is like a red light. Stop doing what you're doing because it's not going to get better. Because right. I think like position changes, they require a lot of muscle movement. And this is very precise movement. So you can get tired. Just imagine doing a couple of repetition of sit-ups. You're going to get tired. Right. Exactly. So that's, it's such useful information. Because yep. let's, I want, I want a very, I want high fluency on this trade cue that I use mm -hmm. with Tucker. I, it, it is a very important cue because it is how I can get the toys back when I need them. Yeah. Um, and so I don't like to mess around with situations where I cue something and I don't get the response I want. I don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with this information from this little session, I'm more able next time to make sure that I time that cue mm -hmm. at the optimal time. Yeah. Like I might, no. right. I might shorten my session or I might say he's really good at it as long as we haven't done too many repetitions of this kind of play or whatever. And you just, you take that data uh, and file it away so that your next session will be more successful. Mm -hmm. Um, and I call it letting, uh, well, if you go with the flow of the motivating operations, you go with that, like you mentioned, you can tell there's a little red flag mm -hmm. 
you know, maybe he, on the fourth repetition, your dog's right foot sticks out slightly, or there's just a hair slower. Yeah, on like latency, I think, is, a, is a very, very good, uh, like, a barometer of yeah. whether or not, right. what, what we should do, actually, in the training session. Right. And then you might, like, know, okay, I do three reps, and then we shift to a different position, or we... We so do something next, else. Right, right, right. And also, I would say that apart from latency, we also can look into what happens between C and A. It's like when you deliver food or a toy, a reinforcer, right? What right. happens is your dog immediately back to offer the next, to, to, to get the cue, right? Got so it. like yeah, a yeah. heart button. And uh, so, for example, I was recently doing a uh, tagging exercise. And so I was... We were tagging with Gaptia, and the criteria was he was just uh, taking the toy out of my hand. That was when I clicked. And then mm -hmm. I tossed some treats on the floor. And I, as he was eating, I placed the toy next to the treats. And my, my feedback was, is he going straight after eating all those treats? Is he going to grab a toy uh, immediately? Or is he going to look around the environment? Is he going to look back at me for cues? Because mm -hmm. then I know something is not good. It's not fluent, obviously. Right. If it's not fluent, then maybe I need to decrease some criteria or make, 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 thing, make things easier to make mm -hmm. sure that I can get this little thing, like that I can strengthen something that happened before to make sure that if we go forward, it's more fluent. Right. Exactly. And that's what I think really skilled trainers are good at. Sometimes mm -hmm. you do it intuitively. You're, you're not sure why you made a decision to shift to something or why mm -hmm. you, uh, you changed something. But the more opportunities we, we give our learners to give us those, th that information, mm -hmm. um, one is, like you said, what's the, what is the latency between consumption of the last reinforcer and the offering of the next behavior? Yeah. What, what happens there? So lots of good information there. Mm -hmm. Or also I like to think of um, when you put your reinforcement processes on cue, like I've, yeah. I consider trade, a trade is a reinforcement process and it mm -hmm. means food, it means food contingency. And I'm starting to call these, I know a lot of people call these location specific markers, but mm -hmm. I, I've been really thinking about it. And for me personally, I don't think that idea is wrong and it's this is just I think it's a contingency specific cue. It's a specific cue that means this contingency is available and it's only this. When I say trade it only means one thing, which is I'm going to put the chicken on the floor right by your foot. Okay. So when I cue trade, the latency in response to that cue mm -hmm. tells me how strong that contingency is right then. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that gives me a little window into the motivating operations are with me, you know, like. Or I'm, not, yeah, or you're or somewhere not, else. Not, you know, and Tucker's very good about being like, he just, and I think it's because I listened and I reinforced this. He's very good at being like, no, not this, now. Is the re this is the reinforcer I want. Sometimes even like I have a pot of food set over here that's like one flavor and I have another pot of food in my pack right? And, and he'll do the, he'll do the session just fine, but he keeps looking there. a little look at the, where the other pot is, you know, or sometimes he'll just go stand there just for a second. And then, and a lot of us in the old days, we would say, oh, we can't let our dogs uh, dictate yeah. that, right? He's, he's got to work for the reinforcer that I say he should have. Uh, you know? And <laughs> I find the more I listen to him, I'm like, well, I just want you to be motivated to do this thing. So is that your, is this the flavor you want? Okay. And then I switch and you should, you, you're be, you'd be amazed. The next f five repetitions are like, boom, or, boom, boom, yeah. boom, boom, with no more little glances or, yeah. Um, so, it, and yeah, so I think motivating operations is a lovely uh, way to open that window. Um, but I think there's a danger there too, because. Mm -hmm. People can start saying things like, I don't, they start, you can make up speculative fictions, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. about, um, cause you don't really know, is your dog really tired or 
Is my dog not satisfied? I, you start getting these words that you're not, you can start making that kind of stuff up and you don't really know. Mm -hmm. I All think you really know is the, the latency that you're getting. Yeah, I think we need to, we need to operationalize what's happening. We need to really uh, define, when I'm saying I see fatigue, what do I mean? Because what I see may be something different than what you will see watching my dog. Right. And right. Uh, we just need to have a very strict criteria. When I say I see fatigue, uh, I will tell you that I see muscles are being, you know, muscles shake, or I see slower movement, or mm -hmm. I see, uh, I see my dog panting, right? And I can tell those things and I can name all those behavior together, fatigue. But if I don't do that, then it's just a label as happy, sad, or uh, right. this is just another label. And I think what you said about uh, the response to a, uh, to a marker cue, it doesn't have to be a location specific. It can be a clicker also. It's how your dog also takes the food, how your dog takes the tag, how your dog responds to a reinforcer. If your dog is normally uh, eating in a certain way, then you can, if you see this change, it also tells you something. It right. also is an information. It's like what I do in the in one of my courses, and it's called Attention Please. We do we measure like the first assignment is to measure how dog responds to the re, to a reinforcer. And it's kind of like a baseline because then you can, if, if it changes, it's a feedback. It's just an additional feedback you can use that something has changed. Right. And I think it's important, like we do, in the old days, I know we did a lot of like, you would rank the dog's reinforcers. So you'd mm -hmm. say his, that's why I mean that word value, his top value is the tennis ball. Uh. And the lowest value is the chicken or whatever. That's not, mm -hmm. that's not going to stay like that all the time. That's not, I mean, mm -hmm. you can kind of get some general uh, predictions, right? That he's more likely um, to accept a tennis ball in right even when he's tired or he's more likely but you can't say uh, that you can't put that hard category on each of the motivators but we don't like yeah absolutely but, but I don't I don't see a value word here as having a decrease of values and that this is the top one this is the uh, this is you know this is the second right. one because Right. When we have, we don't, we not, we don't have, we can't even make a list of reinforcers because there is no such thing as a, as a reinforcer in general. They're always specific to the contingency. It's like right. I, you know, food. I love sushi. I am crazy about sushi, and <laughs> I eat really a lot of sushi. <laughs> but after, and I can do a lot of things to eat that sushi, and. <laughs> But I, I have just, he also likes it. <laughs> but after I eat like 50 pieces, uh, then probably the value changes. Because for me, value, it's never, it's never kind of like, there is never a value of a reinforcer that is stable. It always has to be associated with the contingency. Right. And, and the motivating operations that are affecting that. Mm, so yeah, the cue of the piece of sushi in front of you, right? Yeah. That's a cue. So the cue of the piece of sushi in front of you, it means something in the beginning of your meal. Yeah. It, the, the C of whatever the flavor of it in your mouth or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Right. So the behavior you pick it up and put it in your mouth and then you get that wonderful flavor. That's the C that that means a lot more to you you're more likely to be like eagerly sitting down and getting ready for your meal um in the beginning of your session especially when i'm hungry yeah and by session i mean uh, a meal um yeah. but by the end if they brought you another plate right and another and another <laughs> and and you're finally you're like it's the same cue though right it's still the same piece of sushi mm -hmm. but now you're you might sit back in your chair you might drink another glass of water you might uh start talking to your friend for a while and let that sushi sit there and right? I, may call it, I, I may even share with my friends which i'm not going to do at the beginning <laughs> Exactly. That's a perfect example of it, like a shifting. Um, yes. Now, sati satiation is, I, I think, one of the easiest 
Yeah. Right. Uh, because that's what we talk a lot about is like, if you want an establishing operation, you kind of deprive the, the learner of a certain motivator for a while. And then that establishing operations will increase uh, the strength of that reinforcer. Hey, Becky, I don't think we need any more announcements. Thanks. I feel really safe. Thank you, sweetie. Okay. He takes his job very seriously. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so let's see, what was I saying? Okay. So establishing operations. Yeah. And then you think about, well, if you eat a lot of sushi, the abolishing operations kick in, which means now the reinforcer of sushi is going to be a little less valuable. There's mm -hmm. that word valuable again. Um, you're going to respond with a longer latency and maybe not eat it at all later so those those are simple things but like with the tennis ball mm -hmm. issue that's when it gets kind of interesting and more like an alice in wonderland rabbit hole is like there are certain behaviors and certain reinforcers that seem to not satiate they seem to create an establishing operation the more you do them so that when that's sort of similar to addictive type behaviors right like overeating it is you, you don't have a satiation point you you keep eating because that reinforcement doesn't get status something there's no satiation or satisfaction that you just keep eating or you keep playing that ball um i know tucker's previous learning history with tennis balls was they would run him with the ball until he collapsed oh my god i mean they literally i mean until his feet were bleeding and he collapsed one time I, they told me his previous owner said they tried to tire him out but it and it took him three days to recover like they had he couldn't walk because i mean that's how how much he will play with a tennis ball if you don't teach him <laughs> that's why i spent a long time teaching him and all done q because it's not it's not healthy you know but yeah, but yeah. yeah and that's what we call that that's the new term that you gave me was an evocative effect mm right it's supposed to be a satiating effect but you don't get a satiating effect the more you do something it has an evocative effect um and that reinforcer becomes even more and more and more powerful um so motivating operations can get even more complicated uh when you go down that rabbit hole mm -hmm. but yeah we, we can just assume that of course there is a great chance like uh when we work on antecedent uh side of the behavior and uh we work on antecedent arrangement we often if we provide a lot of uh of toys maybe for dogs that steal toys right you have a kid you have a dog and the dog steals right. Right. uh toys from the from the kid then maybe there is, a, there is a chance that if you're going to provide this, these toys for the dog uh, non-contingently mm -hmm. on the behavior, mm -hmm. uh, then there will be abolishing operation working on those toys as a reinforcer. So mm -hmm. it's not going to engage, it's going to have an abative effect on behaviors that lead to get these toys. Uh, but not all. It doesn't always happen. It's always a study of one, as Dr. Friedman says. So mm -hmm. if you are providing it, if and it doesn't get better, then maybe something else is working and maybe you should analyze it that maybe you need to change something because it's not it's not effective what you do. Right, right. So I mean early on with Tucker's relationship with toys, early in his early days, uh, I could not have toys out. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I just couldn't do it. I mean, I work, I use non-contingent reinforcement with toys in specific controlled situations, but there was no way we could live in the house if toys were present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't even put them in an upstairs room because he knew where they were and he would just bark at the door where the toys were kept. So I actually had to keep them in the car outside like it was just, it was pretty intense so in the very beginning i had to really limit the access and that was me arranging the antecedents yeah. in a way that he could actually sort of relax right because yeah. it wouldn't engage so you so there was no option to engage in the problem behavior right because they just they couldn't but then as he got more and more i don't know what the, if you would say the word healthy uh mm -hmm. over time i mean now the house is filled with toys 
like I've all seen the it. time on videos. <laughs> it's just, uh, we just have toys all the time. And whenever he wants a toy in his mouth, he just picks it up. Um, and we have a lot of ways of communicating when play with me is available versus when it isn't. So, and I, I would agree. I think at this point, it has an abolishing effect in a healthy way, which is there, there's not this obsessive thing about the toys anymore. Um, but it just took a lot of time to, it, to kind of work that out. Build a new, it, had, it was a matter of building a new learning history, right? Slowly. And also some automatic reinforcers, right? It's not always like sometimes what is provided by the learner himself. It's like uh, when the sensation that you are getting, the change of the body chemicals uh, is reinforcing, then if you're gonna, then it's very hard for a trainer especially not experienced trainer to notice it and to change it because right. if you are not mediating the reinforcer right. you are you know you are not necessary right right um and so all of this stuff can get very mm. subtle and interesting and but you know but people like these people like black and white rules they say well this dog this dog should never have toys in the house because you get terrible behaviors or whatever. And yeah. that might be totally true for the first three months you bring that dog home. Yeah. But maybe later on it changes. Like it, mm -hmm. it's, um, and I just find that fascinating because I don't know about you, but when I started out as a trainer, I had a lot more black and white rules, yeah. you know, like, if you provide the right contingency, the dog will always behave in an expected manner. You know, or what I, I had these kind of like things and now it's just starting to become so much more organic. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this understanding of motivating operations just really helps me uh, think about it more deeply. And um, so I, I really recommend people kind of look it up and think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if the terminology, I wrote, uh, I wrote a, lec a, a, a lecture for my Tromplo students on this, and I started out with just don't panic. You know, there's, <laughs> yeah. there's a lot, there's like, because like we have four term contingency, we have motivating operations, establishing operations, abolishing operations, evocative effects, abative effects, and then that variable determining effect, which yeah. is when you get this variability and, and yeah, you and can also have transitive motivating operations. You can have reflexes, yeah, and you can have surrogate. So yeah, let's don't go there. Right. Now. I know, I know, I know. Just but 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 the way I was describing it to people was like it's sort of like it's like reading a really good poem, right? You have to you have to wrestle with it a little bit. You have to and maybe today you can only understand one of these things, or maybe just a little bit of it, or it's just but you wrestle with them. Like maybe three years ago, I could not understand any of this. And, yeah. and probably five years from now, I'll understand it way better. But right now, I was like, when I was wrestling with this, because I had to explain it to my students, then I was like, aha. Yeah. I, get, I understand now. I go, and I understand why this happens in my sessions. With, with yeah, and this is great. It's because we can, this is just, it, it, it's just going to give us more tools to be a thoughtful trainers to be mm -hmm. because what I like about taking all those things into consideration it makes me more aware that I shouldn't blame myself or the dog it's right. just it just happens and right. it, it's it's science yes it happens right, right, right. and Sorry, I just have that. tools uh, to make sure maybe it won't happen next time or maybe right. uh, this is like Recently, I'm going again on teaching Gatcho going around the cone because I've never done th done this properly, and I was kind of like, because this was what was considered the easy exercise, and this is why I wrote today a post that easy is always in the eye of the learner, uh, because for Gatcho right. this is not easy. It has so much history of this behavior, and yeah. to teach him right now correctly, there is so much going on about the antecedents over there and about the history that it's really a difficult one for us right now. And I have to change everything completely. So there is no old history for the behavior because it's gonna 
the old antecedent setting is going to evoke the behavior and it's not going to be the behavior that I want because the consequences are not the gap to is really looking forward to or with the code. Right. Right. So there are motivating operations there. there so what is, what is the cue for all that? Is it the cone itself? You put the cone out and then all of this happens? Uh, it, there is more. There is a, uh, yeah. <laughs> there, there, there is a cone. There is my position in relation to the cone as a cue. And uh, there is a distance also part of it. So uh, there are a few things. And right now, I noticed that we have extremely hot weather right now in Poland, like super hot, like really, really <laughs> hot, not typical in June, hot. And I definitely see a decrease in his activity in the behaviors that have a contingency that still goes back to our old training time. So, you know, we, we changed our training completely and I'm not doing things that I've been doing very long time ago. It was, it's years ago. It was like six years ago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I didn't use, uh, positive punishment. I probably, I use positive punishment, but not in the sense of, uh, beating my dog or, uh, I definitely use aversives, but it was like grabbing a collar but in a nice way <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. and uh, n not providing any choices. Right. Mm -hmm. And right now, of course, a cone is a cone and it's going to be a cone forever. So mm -hmm. the old cue is going to be there and the old cue and my position in relation to cone is still going to be there. So I'm really having a hard time and I really need to break down those things into tiny right. pieces to make right. sure we have different contingencies in play. Yes, yes, that's exactly it. Sorry, I had to plug in and sure. move around. But um, yes, that is the key. That's why I asked you, what is the cue? Because you know, when you, when you were talking about that, I started to think, By, boy, you have motivating operations going on in your head. It's not yes. just his. I mean, you had all this, like, if I see a cone, it's going to be terrible. Like, yeah, like, I had that. Yeah, I like. I recently, I was like, uh, I, I hate this cone. I hate this cone. I'm not going to do a cone. Cone is ridiculous. Why anybody would need to go around the cone? I don't need it. I don't have to do it. It's yep. like, but, and I talked to my fiance and he said, but you want to do it to learn more. You want to do it to actually work with Gapcha to go over it and to teach him differently because you want to be a better trainer, not because you want to do go around the cone. And that's true. That's so... True. And right now I'm looking at the cone. We are getting more friendly together with cones. So, <laughs> uh, and definitely, and, and, and the cones are having this, you know, I, I have this, all this contingency with a cone only when it's go around the cone because I'm fine when they are uh, cones for a start line. I'm fine with they, if they are in a different setting, but go around the cone. I mean, it's getting better, really. I'm changing. <laughs> changing environment for myself also but it's still there and I still see also when I'm in the contingencies that bring back that evoke behaviors and that that where that I was practicing way back in time and that I had issues with Gaptia I'm seeing myself change also like my behavior change because now different things are in play yeah yeah and that's cool. a i think it's a really important point is when you a trainer and dog are working together this is not about just what's in the dog's head yeah. or backpack right uh dog's head we don't know what's in the head but but you know whatever's in that backpack mm -hmm. um in the in terms of motivating operations you bring your learning history as well yeah. right and you're the one uh, communicating. You're the you're one of the biggest A's, right? To any to a, to your dog in any situation. Um, so whatever you're communicating, that that is setting him up for a rehearsal of a certain response. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just really interesting. And it's like a like looking in a mirror, looking at another a mirror that looks in a mirror, and then. Um, so I'm, I'm just excited about all of this. And I, I, I have found a number of my students just really um, found it helpful, just really mm -hmm. helpful, uh, especially the idea that, that 
there's so much pressure to be perfect when you're training, right? Mm -hmm. And your dog should be almost robotic, you know, like fluency. Hey, you. Should be like, sure. Yeah, and that you should be, and, and this sort of opens up this idea that you can tra train to really, really high fluency. And I'm not saying we can't, right? I, I'm not saying that if your dog is showing you variable responses to your cues, uh, it's not just because of motivating operations. It could just be because the dog never learned it yeah. in the first place, right? I did have a I did have one discussion with someone once, and um, the dog kept sort of biting the toy at the wrong time, you know, kind of in a a frantic biting yeah. problem. And the thinking it through bravely, thinking about motivating operations, it was sort of started thinking about well. She's, the dog isn't satisfied enough. The dog started getting into this big, yes. and, I just, and I just said, I don't think she's clear when the, it's a bite cue and when it's not a bite cue. Yes. Like, I think it's just, I, I mean, we can think about all that stuff, but, you know, in the moment, I think it's just, there's a cue clarity problem. <laughs> so yes. sometimes that's all it is. It's, it's just- Stimulus control. <laughs> exactly. Um, yep. And so, but I also think that sometimes when we learn new things, we are looking from this perspective. So mm -hmm. when you learn about motivating operations for the first time, you're trying to look from this, uh, from this angle. So, so like more things are motivating operations for you than, than they should be. And uh, then when you put it all together, then at some point you start to see all those different things and there are motivating operations, there are, there's stimulus control, there right. is also physical preparation and ability to do the behavior, there are consequences and there are distant that incidents and there are so many different things that you should take into consideration and it's like, you know, putting a puzzle together. Right, right, exactly. And usually where, where I find this to be most helpful is, like I said in, in my session with Tucker, with the toys that we started with and the, and the food trade. Yeah. You know, I, I've been working on these toy cues and food trade cues for four years now. Mm -hmm. I have a very clear understanding of the level of fluency mm. that I expect, right, to happen. Yeah. When it doesn't happen as I expect it to, that's when I start thinking this is helpful information for me to kind of right but let's say it was brand new learning he it, mm. the cue wasn't quite clear yet yeah. and there was actually no consistency yet at all then I might look more closely I mean you should always look more closely at the clarity of your antecedents and your training but um do you see the difference like yeah you, it's like you you really have like you have a long-term relationship with an old friend and mm. you know you know their behaviors, you know the things they like, things they don't like, you know how they're gonna respond in certain situations and how they, you know, you, you've got this predictability mm -hmm. going and then something funny happens. Mm -hmm. Like your spouse comes home and is really, really snappy at you when you ask him to do something and you, and you say, honey, like, did, yeah. something happen, did something happen at work today? Yeah. <laughs> and then, right, and then they might say, yeah, I had a terrible day and all this stuff happened and I'm really stressed out. And then you go, oh, because you didn't, you're not acting normal. That's not how you normally act when you come home. Mm -hmm. But today something was different. And everything that happened to you at work today is part of your motivating operations. That's why. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense, right? Yeah, it, it makes perfect sense. And I think it's a very, very good example. So yeah, we have those, we have to be able to, assess the criteria of the behavior in the normal conditions like typical conditions and mm -hmm. uh, if we see like with the example of dog responding to a cue perfectly and meeting the criteria uh, with fluency for three times and then the fourth time something changes of course the, there could be some noise in the environment that was that startled the dog mm -hmm. but if nothing changed in the environment nothing changed in the antecedent sites from cues nothing changed and yeah, like we look at the environment, nothing has happened. Then you may start to think from different perspective. But uh, uh, if <laughs> your first repetition was not fluent, the second was even worse, then maybe there is something going on in the training itself for, in the terms of uh, how the behavior is being taught. What are uh, this, like, is the learner really, uh, has the learner really learned 
this behavior or maybe it's exactly. still in the in the learning phase exactly exactly um so that all of this stuff just helps you um i'm always worried that the more information we put in trainers minds mm -hmm. the more befuddled that it gets you know like 25 yeah. million different marker cues and six or seven different reasons for a variability in your behavior and and sometimes it's it is good to just go back to the simple thing yeah <laughs> and your and your basic simple is, are you clicking and then treating in a way that is clear mm. like that that's what I, I i do i do encourage people um to go back to that because one of the big uh, motivating operation issues that i deal with with dogs that are quote unquote frustrated yeah is that the context cues surrounding a training session are like your cones mm -hmm. right as soon as a dog comes into a session they go the sound of a clicker this the smell of that bait bag uh, the, every, yeah. this this makes me feel I mean, I don't know what the dog's saying, but, and you just start to see like fidgeting and the respiration goes up and you haven't even asked the dog to do anything yet. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you say sit and it doesn't register because the dog is going, but, but you have treats on. And yeah. then, and then the person goes, well, and then the dog sits late. Right. Yeah. But it doesn't get reinforced. So then that gets confusing. And then you just see that a lot and that does carry on. It comes to the next session because those context cues are there, are mm -hmm. there. And that is part of the motivating operations is that learning history. What do these antecedents signal? Mm -hmm. Right. And even if you're giving out the best treats in the world, if it's got that meaning, mm -hmm. right. Uh, ooh, did you, you froze. Did yeah, you still I, hear me? yeah, I can hear you. And now you froze. Oops. But I, uh, we are we back, go. I think. Yeah, we both froze. Okay, that might mean we should probably yeah. it wind things down eventually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could talk about this forever. Me too. <laughs> but it, first of all, uh, I need to put it on Facebook today. Yes, and yes. Then, uh, it has to render, and it renders a couple of minutes, and then it's getting dark, and I need to take my dogs for the last one. So. Okay, I should be so yes. hot in Poland that really I can either go for a walk. Uh, like 6 a.m. or mm -hmm. I can go really late like now which is 9 for me and nice. this is not typical this is like absolutely not typical here right now but uh, yeah so I need to get going <laughs> okay and this was a wonderful conversation I'm glad that we stuck with it because this was the best day for me yeah um, it's, um, even though it didn't work <laughs> in the first place well we'll figure that out later yeah, but uh but yeah, and thank you again for this um, wonderful opportunity just to think this stuff through. This is, some of this stuff is new to me too. So I'm, I'm exploring it with my students and I'm really awesome. having a, a wonderful time. Oh yeah, like oh, your, your students are amazing and your course is amazing. I am following your course, uh, Control is an Illusion. I, I, the feedback that people are giving, it's just, wow. It's, you're an amazing yeah. teacher, simply. So. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I want I want my learners to feel they can go above and beyond and get reinforced for it, and they are doing it. They but. are. They are absolutely <laughs> doing it, and they are doing a great job. But uh, this is because, all because of you, really. You're our amazing trainer. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank all right. Well, have a wonderful walk. Okay. You uh, have a wonderful day because it's morning or noon. I think right it's now. about noon. Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. So have a nice right. day. Thank bye bye. You, bye.